Death is not the enemy of life, but its friend, for it is the knowledge that our years are limited, which makes them so precious. It is the truth that time is but lent to us, which makes us at our best look upon our years as a trust handed into our temporary keeping. We are like children, privileged to spend a day in a great park, a park filled with many gardens and playgrounds and azure-tinted lakes with white boats sailing upon the tranquil waves. True, the day allotted to each one of us is not the same in length, in light, in beauty. Some children of the earth are privileged to spend a long and sunlit day in the garden of the earth. For others, the day is shorter, cloudier, and dusk descends more quickly as in a winter's tale. But whether our life is a long, summery day or a shorter, wintry afternoon, we know that inevitably there are storms and squalls which overcast even the bluest heaven, and there are sunlit rays which pierce the darkest autumn sky. The day that we are privileged to spend in the great park of life is not the same for all human beings, but there is enough beauty and joy and gaiety in the hours if we will but treasure them. This afternoon, we gather to celebrate the nearly century-long life of Meyer Lubin as we mourn his passing. The time of mourning is a complicated time filled with many emotions and memories, both bitter and sweet. We begin our service with a recitation of psalms and prayers, thus linking Meyer's life with the 3,000-year-old tradition of the people Israel and the eternity of God. From our Siddur. Shlah <laughs> Nerl rag vid var chechave or leniti vahati. Beit Yaakov lechuven elcha. Beor adonai. Vehaya yom echad hu yodea ladonai. Lo yom velo laila. Vehaya le et erevi hie or kumi ori. Kiva Orech Uchvoradonai Alaich Zarach. Send me your light and your truth. Let them guide me, leading me to your holy mountain, to wherever you dwell. For you light my lamp, Adonai, my God. Bring light even to my darkness. Your word is a lamp for my, for my feet light for my path. Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of Adonai. There shall be a singular day known to Adonai, neither day nor night, but at the time of evening there shall be light. Arise, shine, for your light is coming, and the glory of Adonai is shining on you. The poem, Death, is a destination by Rabbi Alvin Fine. Birth is a beginning and death is a destination, but life is a journey, a going, a growing from stage to stage, from childhood to maturity and youth to age, from innocence to awareness and ignorance to knowing, from foolishness to discretion and then perhaps to wisdom, from weakness to strength, or strength to weakness, and often back again, from health to sickness, and back we pray to health again, from offense to forgiveness,
from loneliness to love, from joy to gratitude, from pain to compassion, and grief to understanding, from fear to faith, from defeat to defeat to defeat, until looking backward or ahead, we see that victory lies not at some high place along the way, but in having made the journey stage by stage a sacred pilgrimage. Birth is a beginning and death a destination, but life is a journey, a sacred pilgrimage made stage by stage to life everlasting. And from Psalm 18, Im Hasid Tihasad Im Gevar Tamim Tamam Im Navar Tit Barach Vimikash Tit Patal Kiata Imani Toshia Vena Im Ramotash Pil Kiata Tair Neri Adonai Lohai Yagia Hoshai Kibecha Arutz Gedud Uvo Ohale Adaleg Shor Hael Tamim Darko Aim Imratar Onai Trufa Magen Hu Lehol Hachosim Bo With the loyal you deal loyally, with the blameless blamelessly, with the pure you act purely, and with the perverse you are wily. It is you who deliver lowly folk with but haughty eyes you humble. It is you who light my lamp, Adonai, my God, light up my darkness. With you I can rush a barrier, with my God I can scale a wall. The way of God is perfect, the word of Adonai is pure. God is a shield to all who seek refuge. Meyer Lubin was born on March 7th, 1925. When he passed yesterday morning, surrounded by his loving children and a team of beloved caretakers and aides who became like family over the many years that they took care of him and his beloved wife, Gloria, of blessed memory, he was a few months short of turning 100 years old. 100 years old. It is amazing to think of how much change Meyer witnessed in his life, how many times the world shifted and moved forward in the almost 100 years he was here, Today, as we look back on his life, we have the gift of exploring the world through his eyes and the eyes of those he loved and who loved him. A proud Washingtonian, the child of immigrants Mendel and Rivka, a child of the Depression, a soldier of gruesome war in the European theater that is hard for most of us to imagine, Meyer was shaped by his childhood his family, and his upbringing. He did not have an easy life, and his formative years imprinted upon him and guided him as he made his way through this world. One of the hallmarks of Meyer Lubin was a tireless and relentless will, a will to live. Through illness and aging, he lived longer than many imagined his body was capable a will to work hard and provide for those he loved, multiple jobs at a time, devising witty ways to stretch a dollar and his ingenuity to find new avenues for business, a will to fight and survive. Yes, he had a stubborn streak and a will to believe in Jewish practice, tradition and faith. We begin the sharing of memories and stories with his daughter, Cheryl, as she shares of a life well-willed and well-lived.
Dad was born on March 7th, 1925, to Rebecca and Mendel Lubin. He had an older sister, Ada, who he loved very much. Growing up in Washington, D.C., he had to be responsible and help support his family at a very young age. He did not have the luxury of being a free-spirited child. He would sell newspapers on his bike. When a new family moved into their neighborhood, he would visit them and persuade them to sign up for newspapers. He worked so hard, he won two tickets to the World's Fair from selling new subscriptions. Dad continued to work hard selling papers even at the ballpark. He loved sports, especially baseball and football. He was at the stadium selling papers when Pearl Harbor was bombed. He remembered hearing officers' names being called over the loudspeaker and being told to return to their barracks. Dad loved this country. He was a proud American. When he went to enlist in the Army, he went because he could not swim and did not want to fly. He would tell us stories about the infantry and helping to liberate France. The story that stuck to his heart the most was when the Germans were shooting at his infantry and he was in a dugout writing a letter home to his mother. He always believed at the same time he was writing this letter, his mother was praying at his sister's grave and that saved him. Judaism was an important part to dad. He loved services and praying. He never skipped a word. When dad came home from the war, he went back to his parents' home. He liked to play basketball with his friends at the JCC. He made lifelong friends that were always a part of his life. The Ackermans, the Hamburgers, the Povages, the Roberts, the Modlins, the Beermans, and the Deckelmans. On Passover, he went to Shul and saw mom for the first time. He never wanted to step on someone's toes, so he asked Sam Silverman if they were still dating before he asked mom out. When he proposed, he actually went to Nana during a break at work and asked if she would take him as a son-in-law. She said yes, and then he called mom and told her that they were engaged. <laughs> when mom and dad got married, they went to the Concord Resort for their honeymoon. I think it was his favorite place he ever traveled to. He loved the food and the dancing. When they came home from their honeymoon, first they moved in with his father and then soon with Nana. Saving money for a foundation and security was important. They lived in an apartment then. When mom was pregnant with Brian, they bought their house on Crest Haven Drive where they lived for over 40 years. The depression never left dad. He always had to pay cash, whether a house or a car. We had a wall in the basement shelved with foods and paper goods, so we would never run out. During my early childhood, Dad had two jobs, selling cars and doing estimates for Chaffee painting and papering for large buildings and embassies. He ended up staying in the Jaffe business. He worked six days a week for many years. Saturday night, his favorite thing to do was to eat hot dogs at a little table in front of the TV with Brian and I. We would watch my three sons. Was he telling me something about my future? Dad loved desserts. He loved mom's hello dollies, cheese tarts, and sn snowball cake, a chocolate cake covered in white icing with coconut. But I believe his actual favorite was ice cream. When I was a child, sometimes he would eat a half a gallon of ice cream at a time. After dad had a heart attack, he became very controlled with his diet and watch the saturated fats to stay healthy. Sunday was Dad's day off. I remember him vacuuming at 9 a.m. He thought that was late enough for me to sleep. He would, we would go often on drives on Sunday, and he'd say, the car is taking us. He would not tell us. We would not know where we were going. We would often end up at Giffords for ice cream. When Howard and I had our own family, they would come up often. They loved to come up for Thanksgiving. Dad would read the ads with the boys and then on Black Friday take them out so they could get their best deals. They would come up to babysit when we were away, watch them play sports, tournaments, and their graduations. 
He loved to spend the time with his grandsons and watch them grow and mature. Doing your best and working hard was a motto of dad's. You could get an A, but he would still ask why you did not get an A plus, even if it wasn't given. Family was important to him. He came from a very small family and lost his sister at a young age. He especially loved his cousins, Mary and Mitch. He loved to go to Philadelphia and visit them. He was wonderful to Nana and would check on her most days by stopping by and eating his lunch or calling her. He loved to talk to Howard on the phone, probably more than me, about sports and the lack of his golf game. Many times he would talk so much longer to Howard than me. It was like, why is dad calling me? As dad got older, he loved to watch TV. He was happy when you sat with him watching a sporting game, old movie, or Fox 5. Dad learned to enjoy the gym as he got older. He even wanted to use the treadmill when he was on a walker. Even bed bound, he would try to move to keep his body going. Dad had a very long life. You outlived everyone's expectations. You fought for time and to live. Elaine, better known as Sunshine, and her team took the very best care of her, him. Melanie and Brian oversaw everything to make sure all your needs were met and given every chance. Thank you to everyone. Dad, you're at peace now. You were loved very much. Always remember that I love you, Dad. Meyer's capacity for deep love, which shone through in his tireless work to provide for his family, and then his extended family, took new shape as he became a grandfather, and later a great-grandfather. Though it was not until the end of his life that saying the words, I love you, became natural to him, displays of devotion through showing up, spending quality time together, the holding of a hand, a knowing look, the not-so-simple act of companionship, often sitting together in silence to watch and enjoy a ball game, were his expressions of love. We now have the opportunity to hear from his grandsons, Eric, Mark, and Jason, followed by Russell. Grandpa was inspiring. One of my early memories of him was his heart attack. I was five. Memories blend together, especially when you're young, but I remember being scared. But he was resilient. He'd been through the Depression and World War, and his Spartan, Spartan eating habits left, left an impression. He was a survivor, and he gave us the gift of 35 more years. I love that, all those moments. He got to share in so much, all the sleepovers at Crest Haven with my brothers, teaching me to play pool and read Hebrew. I remember following his finger during a Vinu Malkano at Shared to fill in, and I thought of him last week. And I did the same thing with my daughter in services. Uh, at Passover Seder's, I tried to show off my reading to him. My bar mitzvah, he loved bar mitzvahs. <laughs> my Sunday update calls when I was in college, my wedding, and finally him meeting his great grandkids. They knew him as Gigi. Great grandpa. He did what he needed to do. 
I remember all the effort he put into taking care of my great-grandma, my Nana. I was so lucky to know her, and my kids were so lucky to know him. He always wanted to hear all about our lives. I remember talking to him over Healthy Choice ice cream <laughs> uh, as a kid, and then he, he relented as he got older, and more recently over bagels with Olivia. He always wanted to make sure that my wife Jen and I took care of each other. He loved hearing about the littlest details of our daily schedule. In the past 10 years or so, he'd always reminisce about walking me around the neighborhood when I was first born in Richmond as a little baby. And he'd ask if I remember, <laughs> I'd smile. I may not be able to picture it, but I felt his love and his pride in me and in our whole family. I miss you, Grandpa. I can't say that I have an earliest memory of Grandpa. To me, he was just always there, a constant presence. I rem I remember him often making the trip up to New Jersey, always arriving with his driving cap still on. Every visit included endless hours of Monopoly or watching sports together. Thanksgiving, as my mom said, was a time where we spent time sifting through all the Black Friday deals in the paper to find every amazing discount. Grandpa was never one to spend more than necessary. The next day, we were always first in line at Best Buy or Circuit City or wherever the paper led us. Grandpa's stubbornness, sorry, persistence is something I inherited. He was the epitome of resilience. He survived against all odds. In World War II, after being injured, he refused to give up and pushed through some of the deadliest battles of war. After his heart attack, he gave up many of his favorite foods to stay healthy, refusing to let his love of saturated fats get the better of him. And I don't even think about trying to take the check from him. He would fight for every chance to treat his family no matter what. It was sometime during or just after college that I really got to know Grandpa and Grandma better through our weekly phone calls. The one thing we most disagreed on was beer. He tried it once, didn't like it, never touched it again. When I would tell him my weekend plans with a, mis with a mix of disapproval and curiosity, he would ask if I was going to go get drunk. I could talk to him about for sports for hours if you let him especially if his Maryland team happened to be the New York team. He was an avid reader of the New York Post, never missing a day of reading this surprisingly liberal paper. Needless to say, he more than made up for it with hours of Fox News after. As a staunch Republican, if you wanted to get him riled up, just mention something about Barack Obama. I surely took many opportunities to do so. I can only guess what he thinks of Kamala Harris. As I got older, I came to understand how impactful the war was on him and how much he truly loved his family. He'd never miss an opportunity to talk about a few select memories from serving in Europe, especially that time thought he met a nice girl or when he accidentally ate horse meat. At the same time, his family was always his pride and joy. Although rarely outwardly shown, he loved grandma so deeply. When Marissa joined our family, he may have struggled to get her name, call it, name right, calling her Melissa, but he really did love her like a granddaughter. While Grandma was always making sure that I was taking care of Marissa, Grandpa, in his playful way, would rebut, but is Marissa taking care of you? While we remember people for the full scope of their experiences, it's often the final moments that stand out the most. Despite his health and mind deteriorating, the way, the way he felt about Henry joining our family was unforgettable and so special to me. He was over the moon when we told him we were pregnant. And after Henry was born, when we'd FaceTime, Grandpa would break out and sing Yiddish to him as if Henry was right there on his lap. 
When we visited and he could finally hold Henry, I could just see the pure joy Henry was able to bring to him. It was just such a beautiful moment that I will always cherish. And of course, he never missed the chance to express how proud he was of my choice of wife. Grandpa, you are a survivor that continuously defied all odds. Thanks for always doing what it took to keep on going and never giving up so that you could provide for your family and be there to watch me start mine. I am grateful not only did I get to really know you, but so did Marissa and Henry. My earliest memory of Grandpa <coughs> is our trip to Disney World. He and Grandma didn't travel much, especially by plane, but he made that journey to create a special memory with his grandchildren. Family time was always a priority. Growing up, we spent nearly every Thanksgiving together. He would wake up with me early on Black Friday to hit Best Buy. A child of the Great Depression, he was frugal, yet when it came to shopping for DVDs and Xbox games, budget constraints seemed to vanish. Grandpa was in the commercial painting business, and he knew every building block in Washington, D.C. Our paths serendip serendipitously crossed when I managed an office building near DuPont Circle that he had once paid in, in his youth. Our phone calls often started with my work updates. He was genuinely excited about my promotions, especially when I got a private office. For months, he would ask me how I liked it, making me think he forgot. But in reality, he was so proud he couldn't help but bring it up over and over. He didn't travel very much, but always wanted to hear about my travels. Then we'd dive into debates about football, arguing whether the Giants or Redskins were a better team, which was a low bar in recent years. <clears throat> but more than anything, he cared about family. He always asked about my wife, Danny, and how we were treating each other and the latest adventures of our kids, Brett and Kaya. As he neared the end of his life, it was clear that his greatest concern was our happiness and fulfillment. I'm grateful you are at peace now, Grandpa. I will carry your resilience and family first mentality forward in my own life. The first thing I remember knowing about my grandfather was his love for hot dogs. The story as I know it is that after his heart attack, my grandfather received a hot dog quota. He survived the Great Depression, he survived a world war, but apparently he wasn't going to survive an excess of hot dogs, at least according to his cardiologist. I remember going over to his apartment for lunch or dinner with my parents, and someone would always ask how many hot dogs he had this week. He'd usually respond with a light chuckle. As I grew older, I learned that this love didn't just extend to hot dogs. It also covered cake, cookies, ice cream, and anything else that was at least 30% sugar. But in all seriousness, love was the thing that sustained him all these years. Love for his family, love for his wife even after her passing, and love for Judaism. He wasn't the most expressive man I've ever met. I never really had a conversation with him about any of it, but you could see how important his family was to him in the way his eyes lit up when we visited him, in the way he always asked about what I was doing, and in the way he talked about my dad. As my dad puts it, the happiest day of my grandfather's life was my dad's bar mitzvah. While I lived with this canon for my entire life, I don't really think it's true. Judaism isn't just something you do once, it's something you make a part of your life and work on continuously through ups and especially through downs. My grandfather knew that. When he wasn't able to go to shul anymore, he still watched on Zoom. When he really shouldn't have been fasting for Yom Kippur, he always insisted and it was always an argument. Nothing made him happier than learning about my, my and my dad's, my dad's involvement in the Jewish community. I believe the happiest day of my grandfather's life was much more recent, sitting with his son maybe two or three years ago in my grandmother's stitch room, watching some game show reruns from the 80s with the knowledge that his son would stay connected and that I would stay connected to the traditions of his ancestors. I hope today, as we're all here with him one last time as, he lays to, as, he's, as he's laid to rest, we take a part of his values with us, family, Judaism, and most importantly, the intersection between the two. 
May the next time we're all together be a simcha to properly honor his memory. And may there be as many hot dogs as we can eat. Thank you. One of Meyer's greatest joys was seeing his family flourish. He was a worrier. One of the effects of his childhood where money was scarce, one of, the effect, one of the effects was the desire for those he loved to be comfortable, looked after, safe and secure. As you've heard, this was sometimes expressed in funny ways, being adamant about paying for things in cash, not letting his children sleep too late, and a treasure trove of canned goods in the basement, likely in the, hundred, in the hundreds, if not more. And he loved a deal. He loved seeing his children and children make their children and grandchildren make their own ways in the world, thrive, succeed, find love, be happy, and establish themselves in community. It not only gave him great pleasure, but it put him, after all those years, at ease. He could rest a bit easier knowing that his family was not just okay, but they were good, deeply rooted and situated, knowing that the seeds he planted had taken root and grown. Brian, one of those roots, now comes up to share his memories of his father. Loud. Loud. Yes. said loud. So, I'll just start by saying that I was told, um, you know, sure it was traditionally or halakhically, not to say thank you to everybody here and all of your good, any good wishes to be able to say thank you, so I won't. You've heard some stories about my dad and how he grew up. I'm going to um, share again. Some things may overlap a little bit, but there's some things that I just want to share. My dad lived a much different life than I grew up. He grew up in a much different world than we all live in today. My dad's roots were very humble. His parents were immigrants who spoke no English. They came to this country, like many, in search of a better life. From a young age, the age of 10, my father had to shoulder responsibilities that many in my generation cannot even imagine. Picture this, at a very young age, he began working to help support his family in the middle of the Great Depression. And I don't mean nickel and dimes helping out here and there. I mean dollars, because it wasn't a choice. It was a necessity to eat and to be clothed, not something many of us here can imagine ourselves having to do today. He worked at what was the old Griffith Stadium selling programs, which you've heard before. But in the third inning, he used to go between the bleachers, reach down, clean them off, and resell them. As weekends approached on Friday afternoons, commuters who would get rid of their weekly streetcar, yes, yeah, streetcar, passes, dad would ask them if he could have their pass so we could resell them for the weekend and use them and bring them for proceeds home to his parents. From elementary school through high school, our dad was an athlete, not in the NCAA sense, but he participated in every sport he could at school, baseball, soccer, basketball. When listening to his stories about Red Arback, which some of you may know who that is, he was his gym teacher, who eventually became the head coach of the Boston Celtics, the original days in their heydays. I could tell that sports meant a lot to my dad it seemed this was his outlet. It was something just for him. As you heard, Dad served in World War II, spending several years marching through Europe, fighting from one battle to the next in some of the bloodiest battles known. He didn't like to speak about them, about the particulars and his experience, but he would mention the battle names for heart from time to time. It was just too hard for him. I took the opportunity to use Google and look up some names of some of those battles. I felt tremendous sadness for him that he had to be a part 
of that and carry the burden silently as he did through his life. All of dad's lifelong friends grew up together within the same few blocks in DC on Harvard and Irving Street off of New Hampshire and Georgia Avenue where they kind of come together near Howard University. They all stayed close through the years. He also knew everyone who grew up in the neighborhood and always hit the nail on the head when he told us about the person's character. He wasn't shy about sharing his personal opinions. Dad met mom at a party. He was there with one of his friends and they both had dates. The two of them, the guys, got talking and decided that each liked the other girl more than the one they were with. So two weeks later, the guys decided that they would just switch. Based on Cheryl and I being here, it apparently worked. In 54, 1954, mom and dad were married. In 58, Cheryl was born. And in 60, I came along. They moved out to New Hampshire Avenue, which was a little more than a dirt road at the time, and bought a house. Dad paid cash, like Cheryl mentioned earlier. He paid cash for the house. Not because he had a lot of money, but he had a lot of money because he didn't. He took every dime he had saved in the world and paid for it in cash so he wouldn't have to worry about paying a mortgage and so his family, if anything ever happened, would always have a roof over their head. After serving time working for Jack Blank Pontiac, where Dad met famous people who he'd tell us about, mostly Redskins that he had sold cars to, he worked for my mom's side of the family business well into his 80s until he finally joined my mom in retirement. And boy, that, that was tough for him to step down uh, and retire, for him not to do anything. They spent most of their later years cavelling about their grandchildren and their children. So that's a little synopsis of my dad, which you've heard before from my sister and the grandchildren. I want to share just a few poignant things that stick out to me that I remember. Dad was afraid of the water and he couldn't swim until he decided to take lessons when he was almost 50 years old. While I was jumping off the, high, the dive high board, when I was, I think, eight or nine, Dad was just learning to swim. There were community pools when he was young. I really couldn't figure out why he never learned to swim. I ended up figuring out that I had to assume that he was working in the summers and just didn't have time. Dad wore a fedora to work every day, no matter what the weather, hot or cold. He came home, this is something that I could see waiting for dad to walk in the door. He came home, put his hat in a box in the hall closet, washed up and then came and sat down for dinner. All like clockwork, if nothing else, he was a creature of habit. I cherished going to Redskins games I cherish going to Redskins games at RFK with him, starting at six years old. Those are the days when you were allowed to take your son or your daughter or a family member, as long as they were small, and go under the turnstile. And you'd have to sit on your parents' lap or in between the seats. With the bleachers bouncing up and down and my dad and I cheering and sometimes complaining, I just... Love that time. He spoke about his honeymoon many, many times at the Concord in upstate New York, like it was a royal coronation of his marriage to my mom. Dad beamed at my mom. He was a jokester. He, he was the best dancer. You could see him on a packed floor. I've seen movies of him on a dance floor. This guy, the man could dance. I've got the movies, I've got the pictures. I don't have any sound with the movies because they're old. But he was the life of a party. Dad always pressed me to understand the value of a dollar and what it meant. Not to teach me to be cheap, but to recognize its worth and how to use it wisely. It really weighed on him greatly, worrying if his kids would be okay after he and my mom were gone. 
When I was 11 and a half, my bar mitzvah was on the books. Dad decided I was going to lead Shakri through Musaf. Let's just say I wasn't thrilled upon notification. About a year out, we spent every day, not kidding, every day at least an hour or more to get together learning prayers. Definitely not something a 12-year-old was really interested in doing. It wasn't until years later that I realized how important that time was together. He taught me discipline. Now, I know there's some here that might think that that's an unusual thing with me, being disciplined. But it gave me an opportunity to connect with him and to connect to Judaism in the best way he knew how. But I truly believe that it was his way for us to spend time together. As an adult, I realized how it was his way to pass on to me of the things that were most important to him. Looking back on my dad's life, dad always worked. He was always out the door early, got home late. At the time, it seemed very normal, but I missed him a lot. It was my dad. He played it safe. He took little chances, but always provided for his family. I know his youth and how he grew up under difficult circumstances, forged who he was and felt he had to be as an adult. As I got older, I think my dad was 80-ish when we started to talk a little more, mostly about goals he wanted for me, which meant for my family. It seemed the things he was so worried for my family, dad was hoping for assurance and closure. Had he taught what it meant to take care of his family, he wasn't sure. I remember when he was 92, we had a chat. There's this little park in his complex at Leisure World where we were sitting in these Adirondack chairs and sunshine was an earshot away, making sure Papa was okay. And he had a sun hat on, in which he hated wearing, but complied. I told him I thought it was a parent's job to try and do one better for their children than they had done for themselves. I stressed to him it wasn't, I wasn't talking about money. I thanked him as a father to his son for what he had taught me with immeasurable hardships he had had in front of him and that should, he should be proud of his and mom's life's work because he had done that for Cheryl and me. <coughs> To my dad's ladies, Marta from Montgomery Hospice, Jackie, Edna, Mimi, Maurice, Marie, Sonia, Nadej, Joba, and his number one sunshine, Yolaine. Without you ladies, your kindness, caring, selflessness, and love our dad would not have lived as long as he did. My family, all of us, are grateful for everything you have done for my mom and my dad. And to my wife, Melanie, the love you gave to both our parents was special. You were another daughter to them. Their love for you is with them as they now rest for eternity. Dad? I will always remember you as a blessing. Throughout his life, Meyer's will to live was bonded with a deep love for his Jewish faith, for Jewish practice, for attendance at services, for our prayers. How many hundreds of times did he play that cassette tape of Brian leading at his bar mitzvah? Only a year ago, he was singing in Yiddish, no less at the top of his lungs. 
Part of his Jewish connection was his belief in certain things being bashert, meant to be. Had his beloved sister Ada not succumbed to TB shortly before he was slated to ship out with his battalion, and therefore he de delayed when he deployed, he likely would have died on D-Day. He believed that she saved his life. In Hebrew, were, in Hebrew, the words faith, emunah, and to believe, leha'amin, share the same root, aleph, mem, nun. The acts of believing and having faith require having a will and require a confidence and trust in someone or something. In his lifetime, Meyer believed in himself and in those he loved. That belief and deep faith propelled him forward to his dying breath. To Cheryl, Howard, Brian, Melanie, Eric, Jennifer, Mark, Marissa, Jason, Danielle, Russell, Olivia, Dylan, Henry, Brett, and Kaya, may you and all who loved Meyer find solace in his belief in you and your ability to move into this next chapter without him, touched by his presence in your lives. May you be inspired by the faith he possessed and may it give you strength as you continue to make him proud. And in moments when you may find the belief and faith lacking, remember that the Hebrew word amen is made up of the letters that are the root of faith emunah and to believe l'ha'amin. Amen means may it be so. We say it emphatically and with a determination and a will to forge forward. May his memory be a blessing in your lives and may his will guide you, guide you ever forward. And to that we say, Amen. I ask you to rise in body or spirit the El Male Rachamim traditional morning prayer. El Male Rachamim Shochen Pamromim Hamtsemenucha nechonaha tachat kanfei hashchina. Bemalot kedoshim tohorim kizar harakia mazhirim. En nishmat meir ben mendel verifka shehalach leolamo began eden tehe menucha Anna Baal Harachamim, Hastirehu Beseter Knafechal Yolamim, Utsror Bitsror Hachayim Ed Nishmato, Adonai Hunachlato, Venuch Beshalom Mishkavo, Venomahar Amen. May the source of life the fountain of all being, open our hearts to compassion and our eyes to wisdom, that we might glimpse in perfect peace and in sadness the way of all things. May the memory of Meyer Lupin, son of Mendel and Rivka, be a blessing for us forever. May we not permit the light of his love ever to grow dim. May we remember all of his worthy and righteous deeds that his memory be forever bound up in the bond of life. God is our source and our destination, our beginning and our end. May Meyer's passing awaken us to this truth, that the bond of love we shared and share never be severed in sorrow. May he rest in peace and live on with us. And to that we say, Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time we will be proceeding to the grave area, which is here, of course, on the grounds of today in Memorial Gardens. Those of you who are able to stay and join us, after we bring Mr. Lewin out, we will not be going in formal procession, but the cemetery is not so large that you will not see exactly where the hearse will be going. I do invite you to walk if you wish. Please remember that if you do walk to the grave area, you have to walk back.
Ladies and gentlemen, if you could return to chair cars. Thank you. 
הנה לא ינום ולא יישן שומר ישראל, אדוני תומר חבנה אצלך על יד ימיניך. I ask everyone to come in and gather closer as the presentation of, uh, of, of military honors. Ladies and gentlemen, please gather. You may be seated. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please rise for military honors. That's <laughs> okay.
On behalf of the President of the United States and a grateful nation, please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your loved one's honorable and faithful service. You'll notice that there are a number of seats. If you need or would like to have a seat, please do so. Please do not leave any empty. Al mikom o yavo b'shalom, hatzor tamim palo, tikod rahav mishpat, el emunav enahavel tzadik v'yasharhu, hatzor tamim bechol kawal. Mi gamar lo mati pahal Ashalit bimata u bimaal Mi mihi tu mekayehe Morid sheol v'yaal Hatzor tamim bechol maaseh Mi yomar lo mataaseh Haomer veoseh Chesed chinam lanu taseh Ubisput hanekad Kesei haksiva Thank <laughs> you. אשר בידך פקדון כל רוחות, חלילה לך זיכרוננו לנחיות, ויהיו נא עיניך ברחמים, עלינו פקוחות כי לך אדון הרחמים והסליחות. אדם אם בן שנה יהיו אלף שנים יחיה, מה יתרון לו כלא היה יהיה. ברוך דיין האמת, מי מת ומחייה, ברוך הוא כי אמת הינו, מתוטט הכל בעינו, ומשלם לאדם חשבונו ודינו, הכל ישמור אותי הייתן גור. ועדינו אדוני כי צדיק משפטך תצדק בדבריך ותזכה בסבתך ואין להרהר אחד מדעת שפתך. צדיק אתה אדוני וישר משפתך. Is it at this time that it is our duty to place earth on the grave as we lay Meyer to his final rest. I'm going to ask the family to come up first to place shovelfuls of earth on the casket. There are two traditions that we do to express, to express our resistance to do this task which we know we owe Meyer out of love and honor and respect. The first is that we take the first scoop of earth with the back of the shovel to make it a bit harder for ourselves. Then we turn it over and do two or three scoops the regular way. I also ask that you don't place the shovel back in the mound of earth, uh, that you don't hand it to others, you place it back in the mound of earth, rather, so that the other person has to go and pick it up. We're going to make two lines, the family will go first, and then everyone else can make two lines. Brian, you go. Michelle, you come here, Brian.
Russell. everyone to form two lines.
This time we're going to stop with the placing of earth. I ask us to rise in body or spirit the El Male Rachamim. El Male Rachamim, Shoche in Pamromim, Ham Semenucha Nechonaha, Tachat Kanfe Hashkinha. Bimaalot Kirushimatohorim Kizar Harakia Mazhirim E Nishmat Mayer Ben Rifkova Mendel Shahalachle Lamoho began in Tehun Tehen Munuchato Anna Baal Harachamim Hastirehu Beseter Knafecha Leolamim Utsror bitro hachayim et nishmato Adonai hu nachlato Ve'anuch b'shalom ishkavo Ve'nomahar Amen In a moment we will say the mourners Kaddish the Kaddish Yatom 
Following the mourner's Kaddish, I ask everyone over here to form two lines from here to the hearse for which the family can walk through as they walk through. We will say to them in the words of our tradition, Hamakom yinachem etchem betoch sharav leitzion v'yerushalayim. When we leave here, everyone is invited back to 17712 Globe Theater Drive? Drive in Olney to uh, pay condolence call to the family. We can and lunch, because of course. <laughs> we conclude with the Kaddish Yatom. Yit Gadal ve Yit Kadash Shimei Raba Belma Divra Kirute Viam Lich Malchute Bechayachon Uv Yomechon Uv Chayed Chobet Israel Baagala Vizman Kariv Imru Amen. Yehe Shme Rabba Mevorach, the Lamo Me Omaya, Yit Barach, the Yish Tabach, the Paar, the Tromam, the Nase, the Yit Hadar, the Yit Ale, the Yit Halal, Shmeid Kudisha, Brihu, Leila Min Kol, Birchata, the Shirata, Tush Brihata, the Nechemata, Dami Ran Belma, the Mru, Amen. Yehe Shlama Rabba Min Shemaya, Bechaim Alenu Baal Ko Yisrael Vimru Amen, Ose Shalom Bimromav, Hu Yase Shalom Alenu Baal Ko Yisrael Vimru Amen. We make two lines over here. We say to the family, in the words of our tradition, Hamakom inachem etchem el male rachamim rochem pamromim hamtsem nucha nechona tachat kanfei hashchina Bimalot Kiddushima Tahorim Kizar Harakia Mazhirim Enishmat Meyer bin Mendel Rivka Shahalachle Olamo Began Eden Tehe Menuchato Anna Baal Harachamim Hastirehu beseter knafecha liolamim. Utsror bitsror hachayim et nishmato. Adonai hu nachlato. Vianuch beshalom ishkavo. Venomar. Amen.